Um, so we're moving to um, the next uh, session uh, in our program today. And, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a useful segue. In the first session, we saw, um, you know, the topics around inclusive industrialization. And for this part, we want to turn to um, looking at um, the COVID pandemic and some of the some of the insights we can get in terms of the just transition. Um, so I guess a useful start is I'm Mohammed Patel. I'm an economist uh, at TIPS, and we've been doing quite a lot of work uh, around the just transition in the past couple of years. And uh, and we know we've recently been uh, hit by the COVID pandemic. So we really in this session want to explore uh, some of the the research around. Uh, these two very pertinent topics uh, in, in, in the South African development discourse. Um, so this, for, for this session, we've got three uh, presentations. Uh, we've got colleagues from um, the Institute of Economic Justice, um, the AIDC, the Alternative Information and Development Center. And uh, we've got uh, Professor Walwyn from, from the University of Pretoria. And uh, in, in these papers, we're going to, to look at, uh, so the first paper is going, the first presentation is going to look at, um, you know, contrasting the COVID pandemic with, uh, with the climate crisis. Uh, what are the parallels? Where do they diverge? And what are some of the lessons we can learn from the COVID pandemic when we think about the climate crisis in South Africa? Um, the second paper turns to a more uh, a specific focus on the just transition uh, and uh, making sure that um, as we transition to a low carbon world and economy, uh, the justice element uh, is not forgotten uh, when we think about societies like ours with high degrees of inequality and poverty. And then the final, um, the final presentation is, is, is and apologies if I'm butchering them. Um, so firstly, uh, Julia Taylor is a researcher and climate policy lead um, at the Institute for Economic Justice. Uh, her areas of interest are uh, in addressing inequality and creating a more uh, just and sustainable world. Uh, Katrina Lehman Kruber is a, is a climate justice researcher as well at the Institute of Economic Justice and her work uh, focuses on climate justice and addressing questions in the just transition. Um, so their first uh, presentation um, is going to relate to COVID-19 and the climate crisis in South Africa and what are some of the lessons we can learn from that. So colleagues, I'm going to turn over to you um, and you may begin. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I hope you can all hear me and Julia is sharing the screen. Um, so yes, yeah, we can hear you. We can, we can hear you loud and clear. And yeah, it wasn't a butchering of the name, don't worry. Um, so yeah, I'm Katrina Lehman Gruber. Um, and today, together with my colleague, Julia Taylor, I will be presenting our paper, uh, Lessons Learned COVID-19 and the Climate Crisis in South Africa. So um, as mentioned, we come from the Institute for Economic Justice. And as some of you may not be familiar with the IEJ, we thought we'd just do a brief introduction. So the IEJ aims to provide economic analysis to address poverty, underdevelopment and inequality in South Africa. And the research and advocacy we do is designed to equip policymakers, uh, progressive social forces and the public with policy alternatives. And we conduct work in a range of topics, which includes things like feminist economics, macro and budgetary policy, uh, climate justice and then workers rights and social security. And this paper today comes out of our climate justice work and contains some of our initial thinking about the relationship between uh, the COVID crisis and climate change. So we really welcome any feedback as we'd like to, to develop this thinking a little bit further. So as we all know, uh, COVID-19 has been really an unprecedented shock to our social and uh, economic systems around the world. And 
It has tested the resilience, fairness, and even relevance of these systems, and particularly um, in their responses to crisis. And as countries have started discussing ways of returning to normal or, or thinking forward in the recovery, questions have been raised about how we can use the experience of COVID um, to kind of change and think about our current trajectory on climate change. So the aim of this paper is to examine the lessons we can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic and how they can be applied to the climate crisis in South Africa. So these lessons are based on a number of similarities between these two crises. So firstly, they are both truly global in nature. No country has been unaffected either by the direct or indirect impacts from, of either of them. Secondly, um, they experience time lags between their onset and the worst effects. So they have the potential to really spiral out of control if early action is not taken. Um, and this action must be taken before the worst effects are already experienced in, in order to avert them. Thirdly, uh, they rely on expert knowledge and scientific guidance, but neither is only technical in, in nature. Um, they manifest in ways determined by class, power, economics, geography, and so solutions require a holistic and social basis as well. Lastly, um, both of these crises exacerbate existing inequalities. And this also plays out along numerous axes. So we've seen by race, by gender, by class, um, and by ability. Not only are they analytically similar, but they're also tangibly correlated. So a lot of research su suggests that kind of increasing climate change and habitat destruction has the ability to increase the number of diseases um, and our exposure to, to new pandemics. They, on the other hand, there are a number of differences as well that need to be taken into account. So apart from the obvious difference in their nature, they also require very, very different policies to address. On the one hand, we've got physical distancing, on the other hand, we've got a kind of changes in energy production. This links their different timescales, both in terms of their impacts, as well as how quickly they can be brought under control. Thirdly, the relationship between individual actions and positive outcomes with COVID-19 is much clearer to observe um, and more directly experienced. And this applies at a country scale as well. As we have countries instituting certain regulations or mitigation measures, and they very directly uh, see, see the positive impacts in the COVID-19 pandemic but that's less clear with climate change. And then lastly, climate change has more variable impacts on different countries. So some are might, more likely to experience drought, others more hurricanes, and that therefore the adaptation measures required are quite different. So these differences are also quite important to keep in mind because they illustrate that, that climate change is longer, it's more heterogeneous in impact and, and more complex to address as a whole. Thanks, Julia. So the first lesson is that adequate and accessible social protection is required to protect the most vulnerable. So social protection includes the right to social security and an adequate standard of living. And that's really formed a fundamental basis of all most countries' um, COVID responses. And in South Africa, of course, we've seen uh, the social grants. We initially saw some uh, the top ups across the grants, as well as the and the SRD grant. And while they proved to be really essential, they also um, were inadequate um, in various ways. So firstly, they ended prematurely. Um, and only now after immense pressure has the SRD grant um, been reinstated. Secondly, they've simply been too little. Um, so the top ups on the one hand, but also the SRD grant sitting below the food poverty line has not managed to stave off the increase in hunger um, that we've seen and, and many families have experienced in the last um, year. And then thirdly, women have been insufficiently covered um, by the grants. So social protection has also been worsened by ongoing austerity, which has affected service provision and has also resulted in the decrease in the real value of the grants. And like COVID-19, climate change also affects um, the most vulnerable, the worst, and particularly those without the resources to adapt, move, or compensate for loss. 
because of this, social protection is fundamentally a part of resilience. And when we think about what climate resilience looks like, this reinforces the need for universal social security. And as many of you will be aware, there's been a massive push again for the universal basic income, income grant or guarantee. And this will help provide a base to support both the chronic and acute crises of climate change um, as we see them increase. Next slide, please. The second lesson is that care work must be appropriately valued. Care work involves attending to the physical, psychological, emotional, and developmental needs of one or more other people. So this illustrates that every person in their lifetime requires care, and care is an essential part of any society and economy that values well-being, solidarity, and people's development. However, we are currently in a crisis of care, illustrated by the pandemic. Similarly, this has been worsened by austerity, which has chronically underfunded care systems uh, throughout the country. However, this does not mean that care work goes undone. Rather, it is borne mostly by women, um, either for no or very little pay. And, and while we recognize that care work is always important, it is particularly essential during times of crisis. Care workers are at the front lines of acute crises, such as COVID-19, as well as the acute crises of climate change. We therefore expect that climate change will increase care requirements. And so without reform child care systems, it will largely be women who bear this burden, which acts as a significant inhibitor to their, our um, economic, social, and political participation. In order to address this, uh, we need policies that value care work appropriately and recognize it as low carbon work. This includes improved pay uh, for professional care workers, public investment in care work and other social services which make care easier, such as public education, as well as water and sanitation, and then legislation to redistribute unpaid care work in the household. So this could include things like flexible working hours, compulsory equal parental leave, and even shifts towards a four day week as we've seen uh, being discussed in some other contexts. Next slide, please. The third lesson is that a capable, trustworthy and strong state is essential. COVID-19 has really re-emphasized the role of the state. They have formed the bedrock of responses to COVID both in terms of kind of healthcare systems as well as social and economic support and relief. We've also seen governments taking action that we've never, never before seen. So in Spain, um, they nationalized the private healthcare system during the, um, the height of their pandemic. And the most successful responses to COVID saw early action by states in instituting preventative measures, decisive communicative and consistent leadership, national research, innovation and manufacturing capacity, particularly in medical equipment, and then extensive social relief and support. So while the South African government was praised for some of its initial uh, response to COVID and particularly how swift it was, much of what has come later has been plagued by corruption particularly, but also bureaucratic inconsistencies and obstacles, um, both in the health response and, and in the relief measures. So in order to address the climate crisis, uh, we, need an, we need an expansion of these successful principles. We need a state that acts proactively, provides positive direction, capacitates itself for times of crisis, and acts as a key investor, both in itself and the economy. Fundamentally, this requires a shift away from neoliberalism, where the state has been used only to support markets and act in response to crises. Instead, however, what we've seen is that the government is reaffirming its approach to fiscal consolidation during this time of crisis. I'll now hand over to Julia, thanks. Thanks, Katrina. So the next lesson um, is linked to the third in terms of the role of the state, but really focuses on what some of the other speakers this morning have already touched on which is the need for localization of industrial processes. And we're, far, we, we're making the point here that localization will increase resilience of our economy and, and, and help the, the state to address both um, kind of 
health crises as well as future climate crises. The South African economy is structured around a minerals energy complex, and this has meant that we have commodity dependence on mineral resources. Our manufacturing sector um, has actually been in decline um, and, and has fallen from 16% to below 12%. This has also been tied to declining employment intensity in the economy, which is already facing an unemployment crisis. So we have been unable to increase manufacturing activities, particularly outside of the MEC structure. Firms within the MEC, the Minerals Energy Complex, such as the steel sector and Sassel, as mentioned earlier by one of the other speakers, have successfully exploited public incentives without supporting lo local industrialization. And we say, argue that this is partly due to a lack of coordination and discipline from the state. South Africa is vulnerable to global supply chain disruptions. Um, so global supply chains have been significantly disrupted during the pandemic, particularly in food systems and medical manufacturing. Food supply chains have been affected due to labor shortages and disruptions in networks of transportation. Medical manufacturing capacity has proven to be insufficient to respond to a health crisis of this magnitude. With shortages of personal protective equipment, medical equipment and vaccines. If South Africa were able to increase localization, we would improve resilience to health crises and even future climate crises. An opportunity in this sense is to look at renewable energy technologies, which have also been mentioned um, earlier today, and we would like to highlight. Um, our mining sector has developed significant technological capabilities. And so question is, how can we harness these um, capabilities to, to link to new areas of industry like renewable energy? This can also support the move to a low carbon economy, which is the necessary step to reduce carbon emissions. An interesting example um, this year or over the past year has been the repurposing of technologi technological capabilities um, in South Africa to produce 20,000 ventilators um, through a partnership between the Department of Trade and Industry and the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory with a project to repurpose their capabilities of building a radio astronomy dish towards manufacturing ventilators. Um, it's argued that this project was successful because of the prior investment in research infrastructure and funding from the Solidarity Fund. So in line with Katrina's points about a proactive state, um, it, feel, it seems that prior investment um, in this kind of infrastructure could really stand us in good stead in terms of resilience to climate crises too. Localization of industrial processes in South Africa would promote diversification, increase productivity and job creation and improve resilience to health and climate crises. Um, there's an opportunity in our reconstruction plan to strengthen the approach of localization and prioritize key sectors of food systems, medical manufacturing and renewable energy technologies to achieve increased resilience. The fifth lesson relates to international cooperation. So as mentioned, one of the similarities between the two crises is that they are both global problems and require a global international response. Um, however, we've seen that many of these responsive responses have largely failed. So in the climate crisis, unfortunately, the Paris Agreement has failed to so far reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Julia, sorry to disturb you. You have about a minute left. Okay. Um, the Paris Agreement has not reduced um, greenhouse gas emissions. The principle of common but differentiated responsibility has, oops, sorry, um, has not been applied. And vaccine nationalism in the sense of the COVID crisis um, and intellectual property rules have allowed for inadequate supply and access to vaccines. We can't allow this injustice across international um, kind of supply chains to rule how we respond to these crises. Um, and so opportunities, there's an opportunity for glo the Global South to act kind of cooperatively and for South Africa to raise its voice as it has done in terms of the IP um, for vaccines. I'm just gonna skip ahead so that we don't go too over time. Um, sorry, just one thing I wanted to mention here is that some initiatives that could be put forward 
around international cooperation would include a negotiation of a COVID-19 slash climate debt relief initiative, ensuring a united front from African countries and designing a re regional economic reconstruction plan to facilitate regional um, development too. Um, the final lesson is that crises worsen inequality, especially gender inequalities. So we've seen that in South Africa, women, children, black people, informal workers and low income workers have been worst hit by the pandemic. Um, whereas the highest income groups have experienced little in in impact. So in terms of COVID, um, you know, middle to income workers have, or middle to high income workers have been able to work from home, um, have been able to supplement their income with, um, you know, support from family. Um, whereas you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to say the same for for low income and low skill jobs, who've also been most impacted by job losses. This is going to be similar with climate change, as inequalities are worsened by climate change. Social and economic vulnerabilities are key determinants of the severity of impacts of climate change, um, and the situation can result in. Um, you know, families and communities being trapped in a vicious cycle of worsening well-being, livelihoods, health and safety. Whereas wealthy individuals and households are able to shield themselves from many of the impacts of climate change through adaptive technologies, diversified income streams, financial resources to rebuild or recover, and insurance. So finally, um, we... I think the key message is that climate change will continue to worsen poverty and inequality. Um, and it's fundamentally an injustice. So this is why we, we also feel that like a just transition is, is central to, to how we address not only the climate crisis, but other broader social ills as well. Um, this embeds an understanding that um, should be coordinated and holistic economy-wide and response and a response that directly addresses the underlying issues. Just a final thought, um, as Katrina mentioned, this is kind of emerging research that we're working on. And some of the thoughts we have for further development of this work is really the, the role of the state. Um, as highlighted in a few points, um, there's, a there's a need to shift to a more interventionist state um, but has this been the case in South Africa? Um, is it temporary or could it constitute a shift from neoliberal state to developmental? And how do we address these questions in the context of a severely capacity strained South African state? The second area that we want to explore further is um, how the COVID pandemic and climate crisis are both results of the exploitation of nature normalized in the current economic system. It's been just, this exploitation has been justified by a separation of humans from nature, which is a, an irrational belief, which has allowed us to destroy the very planet we depend on. Um, a review of our relationship with nature so that we place humans as part of nature is needed, we feel. So we'd love to hear um, kind of thoughts on this. Thank you so much for the time. That's us. Cool. Um, thank you so much to uh, the IEJ team for that presentation. I really enjoyed going through the paper as well because it really, you know, when we think about the COVID pandemic, it just hit us uh, out of the blue, really. And the scale and, um, you know, the, the magnitude of the impact was, was severe. But um, in all likelihood, this, will, this is a sort of, you know, it's anticipated it will be with us for a little while. And when we take a step back and we look at the climate crisis, this is a much more protected, longer term, complex problem that we need to deal with as economies and societies. And... Um, it's really important. Uh, it's very easy to forget how, how the scale of the climate crisis is just because of the nature of it. We, we don't see um, the severe impacts well, yet, perhaps. Um, so very useful insights uh, from the IAG team and a nice uh, sort of ending off with those two areas of, of, uh, uh, of, of debate. You know, it's the role of the state. Uh, what is the role of the state? Do we need to revisit that? Uh, and also the nature uh, our, our kind of the human uh, society nature relationship and whether that needs to be revisited. It's a common theme that comes up when in, uh, as well in the just transition literature as well, evaluating where we stand and our industrial process, etc. So thanks to the IAJ team for that. Please, um, if there's any questions that come through, please feel free to uh, 
to put them in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, next, we turn to a presentation by Dominic Brown uh, from the Alternative Information and Development Center, the IDC. Um, Dominic Brown is the um, Economic Justice uh, Program Manager there. Um, sorry, just give me a second while I pull up his bio. So um, Dominic Brown's the Economic Justice Program Manager at the IDC and he's been there since 2015. Uh, we, uh, Dominic is no stranger to us. He's uh, participated in some of our Just Transition seminars before. So glad to have you back, Dominic. And uh, yeah, please, uh, please kick off. Thank you, Mohammed, And thanks to TIPS for organizing this session. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Great. So I'll echo and build on some of um, the presentation by Katrina and um, Julia. I will start off by agreeing that the pandemic has definitely been a great magnifier. In addition to ravaging health systems, the pandemic has exacerbated food and housing insecurity, deepened unemployment and put the spotlight on existing inequalities and even made them worse. And of course, growing awareness in South Africa around, in relation to these problems has brought renewed hope uh, in the possibility of a response to the pandemic that could aim for a just transition to a low carbon economy. And I think South Africa, uh, potentially, more, potentially more than most countries, is in desperate need for a just transition. But any discussion about the just transition uh, cannot be um, had without um, locating it within, I think, two important processes. The one, the deep um, structural um, unemployment and deep inequalities that we face in the country, uh, where there are now more than 11.4 million people unemployed. And of course, in the context where South Africa remains uh, a major uh, emitter of um, carbon emissions and is one of the um, uh, most carbon intensive um, countries per capita in the world, uh, a currently ranked 13th. Uh, these seemingly distinct issues are in fact um, deeply intertwined and rooted in the South African government's longstanding and unwavering commitment to the unraveling mineral energy complex. This has been sustained by a macroeconomic policy aimed at attracting foreign direct investment, uh, deregulating financial markets, and liberalizing liberal, liberal, uh, I always struggle, liberalizing trade, um, primarily for the um, in support of an export-led growth model, um, which includes the export of commodities and cash crops, in spite of the detrimental um, impacts. Uh, ecological and social impacts that these industries um, have. Now, this uh, process is, I would argue, and AIDC argues, is rooted in a, a broader macroeconomic framework centered around neoliberal austerity. And in spite of more than two decades of these policy failures in South Africa, and more than four decades of these failed policies globally, government has doubled down on this framework. I think there are at least two significant examples of this. The 2021 uh, national budget, which implemented the harshest um, uh, budget cuts um, in post-apartheid South Africa, uh, which includes cuts to the public sector wage bill, cuts to social services and infrastructure, and also uh, 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 other key uh, expenditure items, not least uh, social grants. The second uh, major example, I think, relates to uh, the president's or a letter recently um, submitted by the, by the president on the 5th of July, where he indicates two things. High commodity prices and rising global demand is good for our economy, particularly the mining sector. Rising global metal prices will play a significant role in accelerating our recovery from the pandemic downturn. Mining is vital to our economy and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. Let's grasp the opportunities that exist in the sector so that mining can help guide our path to a more inclusive and, equi and equitable economy. Ironically, in the same letter, the president acknowledges that mining has historically been central to South Africa's deep inequalities, 
And the second thing that was announced or uh, reaffirmed in the, the letter from the president was the decision to facilitate um, uh, increased private generation of energy up to uh, 100 megawatts. Um, and he argued that this demonstrates the kind of smart measures that we need. Now, while many in society have been critical of the massive budget cuts, um, there's been large support um, for the calls to, uh, by the uh, measures implemented or called for by the president, president recently. What the, what the increase in um, private embedded renewable energy amounts to is the acceleration of um, privatization. And um, here we don't have to look any further than a note from the horse's mouth. Um, ESCOM CEO Andre Dorato makes it clear um, that this is a process towards accelerated um, uh, 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 privatization when he says that um, the shift to increase private embedded, embedded, embedded generation to 100 megawatts is the precursor to the development of a new electricity supply industry in South Africa, which is going to be driven by far greater dynamics. Um, and that the ESCOM unbundling or restructuring is very much part of that as the formation of, separate, of a separate transmission company should act as a catalyst to enable significant additional private sector uh, investment in generation. This process and the massive cuts to the austerity budget are two uh, sides of the same coin. Now, there's been, uh, as I've been saying, there's been wide ranging support for the announcement for the increase of embedded um, private energy, uh, private embedded energy. And central to this wide ranging support um, relates to the idea that investments in renewable energy will inevitably rise as the cost of renewable energy continues to fall. This misconception is based on notions that the falling cost of renewable energy will reach a tipping point um, where the cost of renewable energy will fall below um, the costs of energy for fossil fuels. And this will inevitably lead to a shift in investment uh, with increased levels in investment being directed to renewables. And in this way, uh, the process towards decarbonization is inevitable. Uh, but lessons from international energy trends indicate that this may not be the case. Um, and the world is actually not on a path towards de decarbonization. What's behind this is that lower bidding prices also mean narrow profit margins and that the anticipated le falling level of profits reduces returns on investment and thereby disincentivizes the private sector investment in renewables. And I think in it's in this context that we can understand this note from the uh, International Energy Agency Executive Director from last year, which says, despite a record in global emissions this year, the world is far from doing enough to put them into a decisive decline. It's in this regard that uh, the proposals uh, from trade union movements who have been vociferously rejecting unbundling um, which uh, may seem limited and dom dominated by self-interest should not be dismissed by anyone who's interested in advancing a just energy transition. This is because the increased rollout of private renewables may not, may not only have a negative socioeconomic impact, but it also given that the for-profit model on which the private renewable energy um, model is based is not able to drive a energy transition at the speed required to avert, avert ecological catastrophe. So if we are realistic about this though, it opens the door for a public pathway. We will see that it opens up the door for a public pathway towards urgently addressing both the social, advancing a socially, socially and economically just energy transition. Of course, um, proposals towards unlocking a public pathway for a just transition uh, to a low carbon reindustrialization path will require large levels of resources. And in the first instance, it will need an immediate solution to ESCOM's debt crisis, which is apparently estimated to be a, about 400 billion Rand. And of course, the situation at SOE debts like ESCOM is not unrelated to um, government's um, growing debt and debt to GDP ratio, which is of serious concern. It's in light of this that um, Treasury has been prioritizing debt service costs 
for the greater part of a decade um, in a process that uh, former director, uh, Deputy Director General of the Treasury uh, Budget Office, Michael Sachs has called um, uh, austerity without consolidation. And so now we're expecting uh, the debt, or in fact, the debt has reached um, above or just under $165 billion, which is approximately just over 80% of GDP. Now, this is where uh, the power of the government employees pension fund comes in. Currently, um, even after the uh, pandemic, the government is employees pension fund is estimated to have more than 1.8 trillion rand in accumulated um, assets. This is largely under the asset management of the public investment corporation, um, which directs a large amount of these assets uh, into the JSC. And on the right hand side, you can see that South Africa is actually an overly financialized economy, um, where one source uh, indicates that uh, the JSC market share as a percentage of GDP is around 300%. And just to say, um, in relation to the Buffett indicator, uh, which is this uh, market capitalization as a percentage of GDP, anything above 115% is seen as um, alarming levels and um, cause for concern, um, uh, as it may hint at the fact that there is a, 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 a bubble in the financial markets. Now each year, except for last year, the government employees pension fund has been making uh, a surplus. Um, and what we at AIDC are saying is that what we can do is we can redirect um, large levels of investment from uh, uh, the, the JSE um, towards providing uh, or taking on domestic bonds from government. So the GPF can act as a debtor or a greater debtor to government, but do it at um, below market interest rates. This would in fact allow um, sustainable returns on investment um, and more secure returns on investment. Uh, it's unlikely that you'll see a massive shock like we did um, to domestic bonds um, that we have seen uh, in relation to the JSE last year as they following a massive outflow of capital. So if you do this, um, you can not only take on large levels of ESCOM's debt, but in fact, you can liberate at the more over, an, over a trillion rand to uh, uh, finance a, a, a reindustrialization program, which would, would also require a breaking uh, from an austerity agenda, agenda. So in conclusion, I would say that um, the, the, the struggle um, for a just transition is not just a technical issue, it's a political issue, and that there are resources available to finance, public resources available to finance a just transition. And I've just touched on some in this uh, presentation and there's uh, uh, more detail in the paper that I've submitted. But ultimately, um, for us to harness those resources for a, a, a feasible transition uh, towards a decarbonization, towards decarbonization requires us to rethink our understanding of the role of the economy. And like uh, Katrina and Julia have indicated the role of the state. Uh, and then the struggle over the economy is also at, is therefore at the heart of the struggle to meet the challenges uh, the, of the ecological crisis. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that presentation. Um, Dominic, and uh, really bringing to light some of the social justice issues that we see, and some of the some of the very important uh, challenges that we deal with when thinking about um, the transition to to low carbon economies and societies, and the justice elements involved in that. Um, next, we're going to turn to Professor uh, David Baldwin, um, who's from the University of Pretoria, and uh, so uh, I guess by way of introduction, uh, Professor Wallman is a professor in the Graduate School of Technology Management at the University of Pretoria and a visiting professor 
uh, in the office of the Saatchi Chair in Transformative Innovation, the Fourth Industrial Revolution and Sustainable Development at the University of Johannesburg. Um, so today, uh, Professor Wolven's gonna present uh, some of his work around looking at um, government spending in a financially constrained environment and how uh, South Africa's rising debt levels uh, need to be uh, accounted for when thinking about spending and how to prioritize spending. So uh, let's turn over to Professor Walwyn, who's going to give us some uh, useful insights into to expenditure and the constrained environment. Over to you. Thank you ever so much. Just to check, Mohammed, that um, you can hear me. OK, let me start my slideshow. Um, uh, from here. Okay, so hopefully it's all working. Um, just by introduction, I mean, I've been at several TIPS fora um, and not ever before online. I've always enjoyed them and I'm sure this year will be no exception. Um, in a way, the beginning part of this presentation just reiterates all of the key points that were made earlier by Saul and Fiona about, you know, obviously there's an imperative for growth. We're in a situation with fiscal constraints. Um, and I'm arguing a little bit, not really in the way that Dominic did about raiding the government's pension fund to finance the transition, but more around how innovation policy and investment in R&D can help deliver um, the necessary public good for an economic recovery. And so um, obviously the relevance to the conference theme is this issue around recon um, reconstruction and recovery. And my main proposition then is that public funded research, development and innovation is not just important, but critical for the recovery. So this is the argument of innovation led growth um, for those who may be a little bit unfamiliar to, with in, innovation policy. And of course, there's lots of debate about its validity um, and uh, whether one can rely on innovation led growth, but particularly within our present economic context. But that's exactly the kind of questions that we could seek to answer at the end. So why do we need an upturn? Well, as I said, speaker after speaker has indicated that we need an upturn because we're in dire straits. The pandemic has devastated the economy and it was already in a poor shape with massive levels of unemployment. Um, the economy has grown since 1994 without doubt, but employment took a bit of an upturn and is now back down to 1994 levels. So um, we definitely need an upturn. Um, and I'll cover that. I'll also talk a little bit about this issue of can we afford to spend money which we don't have? Um, Dominic, I think, was arguing that we have the money um, and we should be able to spend it. The money is in the government pension fund. But I mean, this is the, the discussion really between fiscal and monetary policy and modern monetary theory. So I'm going to talk a bit about that and then I'll talk about how we can engineer the upturn given this fiscal constraint that we're in. And particularly, I'm going to show some evidence for why R&D or research and development is what we might call counter cyclical. Um, and finally, in the last few slides, I'll talk a little bit about how we should spend the money. So it's a little bit more focused maybe than the first speaker um, talking about funding for a just transition. These are some more specific suggestions as, as to how um, the our innovation led growth can be realized. In the beginning of the paper, there's a uh, description of a simple Excel or spreadsheet model for public finance. And I'm just showing it here. I'm not going to go through these numbers. So don't get terrified um, by numbers. But essentially, it uh, starts with the GDP and then government expenditure and then the level of um, debt and the debt repayments. And basically what it does is it calculates this ratio, the debt to GDP ratio, which Dominic also mentioned that standing at 80% at the moment, it calculates that through the next uh, yeah, 20 odd years until 2040. Um, and so the, um, if you run the model and the details are in the back of the, um, the pa full paper that I have um, submitted for this, uh, forum. Um, and the, 
So it's quite easy to reproduce it, I think, with a little bit of knowledge about how government finance works. So there, this is a, just showing uh, what would happen to the debt as a percentage of GDP through the next 20 years. Um, if the economy were to grow at different rates and here if it doesn't grow at all that's what happens to the the debt to gdp ratio um if it goes at two percent um that is the blue line and then the 4.1 percent is the green line and i'll come to that again now so the number that's often given by economists is that we need to get the debt to gdp ratio down to 60% of GDP by um, 2040. And to achieve that, we would need to have a growth rate of about 4.1%, which that's in real terms and nominal terms, that would be a, a bit more depending on the levels of inflation, but around seven to 8%. So we need a, a significant growth. Um, the, the other actually, issue in the model, which I'm just briefly going to touch on, is what is the effect of interest rates. Um, and the present interest rate is a, um, between 5 and 7%. That's what we're paying in real terms on the debt. Um, and the debt to GDP ratio, then the way in which it would come down as a function of different interest rates um, is shown in this graph. But here's the figure of about 4.1%. So the, the, um, the that uh, basically the, the, it, it crosses that, um, the magic line of getting debt repayment within realistic brackets um, at, about a, at a GDP growth rate of about 4%. But the higher the interest rate, the longer it would take, and that's an obvious conclusion. The more you're gonna pay on your debt repayment, the longer it will take, even at relatively high levels of GDP growth. And so the, we need an upturn to fund the debt trap. Um, and I know this is a very fiscal policy um, perception. Um, and I'm gonna come in a minute to how that might be reframed. Um, but it, for the moment, here's this quote, which comes from Wood um, 2021 in the Daily Maverick. Um, and there are only two ways to escape the debt trap, escaping growth so the tax revenues rise or decreasing spending. And obviously decreasing spending as other speakers have already made clear is a significant political and social risk. Um, and so the, the better option would be to have um, economic growth. So um, now I'm gonna come on to the second question, which is can we afford to spend the money that we don't earn? And if you haven't read this book by Stephanie Kelton about the deficit myth, modern monetary theory and the birth of the people's economy, um, I can seriously recommend that you read it. Of course, it applies quite specifically to the US and it talks about the Fed and the Treasury and the US. Um, and a lot of it is not directly analogous to our public finance context in South Africa. But it does make this very strong point that we need to rethink the way in which we um, frame, if you like, deficit spending, that in fact, deficit spending is stimulatory funding from the public to the private sector, um, because government is spending money and it's stimulating the economy. Um, and in a way, the only thing that you really need to be concerned about in the deficit is inflation targeting. So if the government is spending more money than it should, regardless of what its income is, um, then the should would be the rise, what will happen is obviously rising inflation. And so in this way, Stephanie Kelton brings in the fiscal policy into what we would typically or conventionally call monetary policy. So the deficit is immaterial, especially in countries like the US, which can create money. Um, national budgets are not like household budgets. So this idea that we have to balance the books maybe is a little bit overdone. Now, certainly in South Africa, I would be the last person to argue that we should have unconstrained government expenditure um, that would simply erode the value of the currency and would cause massive inflation. And we know there's lots of examples of how that has happened in other countries. So I'm not taking a full Stephanie Kelton perspective, but simply to say, yes, there is an a way in which one might rethink 
um, monetary and fiscal policy. So fiscal policy is important from the perspective of fiscal discipline and monetary policy in, uh, in the way it's exercised in South Africa with the control of the interest rates um, to manage the inflation. Um, reframing those might be useful in this period of uh, the kind of post-COVID fiscal environment that South Africa finds itself. So now I am going to move on. Um, they, you know, they, there's lots more interesting material to cover in modern monetary theory. And if anyone has questions, which would be a pleasure to do that. But I'm gonna talk about does R&D fall outside the policy framework of fiscal discipline and, um, and the kind of monetary policy environment within which we operate. And I am going to argue that yes, it does for three reasons. Um, and the first reason is that R&D is a bit like what the Reserve Bank might, uh, how uh, and the conditions under which the Reserve Bank might intervene in the economy through something like quantitative easing. And that is the condition of inverted yield curves. So um, R&D is a bit like an inverted yield curve. When private firms lose confidence in the future, they cut their R&D expenses. And an inverted yield curve is precisely at a reflection of a loss of confidence in the future. So just to show you an inverted yield curve, this here is a, hopefully you can see my arrow, but this is a normal yield curve. So government treasury yields increase with duration or time to maturity. And that's very logical. That's how it should be. If you give up the liquidity on an investment amount, the longer you give that up, the more you should be recorded, I mean, rewarded, and that is the normal yield curve. So as the duration goes, it gets higher, the yield curve rises. An inverted yield curve is the opposite of that. And that's when investors lose confidence in the future. And what they do is they prepare to pay more for um, shorter time period investments. And um, an inverted yield curve then is the point I'm making is simply it's a bit like R and D. So in the time of in in times when the private sector loses confidence in the future, they cut their R and D, and that means that public R and D needs to step into the breach in exactly the analogous way as we understand quantitative easing. Um, so the second uh, argument that I'm going to use to say that R and D falls outside the policy framework is the Nokia case study. And then I'll talk very briefly about COVID-related public funding in the UK as another example. So let's get on to the, um, the, the Nokia case study. But just before I do that, this just shows the spread between the two-year and the 10-year yield. Um, so if you remember the yield curve, this should be positive in a normal yield curve. When it inverts, then it gets negative. And you can see that inverted in, and this is described in the paper in these years in 1989, 2000 and, uh, 2001. And these in the darker lines here are the periods of recession within the US economy. And hopefully you can see, I've got a panel in front of my screen, but around 2020 and 2019 was another one. So here is the story of Finland. And I, I came across this in the 2000s, and I just thought it was incredibly interesting from an innovation policy perspective. Basically, the, what happened in Finland in the early 1990s was a severe economic downturn. And partly as a consequence of Finland being divorced, if you like, or dropped from Soviet supply chains, um, partly as a consequence of government over expenditure and partly as a consequence of the Finnish economy being very heavily focused on forestry and forest products, much like South Africa's economy is presently heavily focused on minerals and mining. Um, yeah, I mean, I, okay, maybe that's, it, that's a slight exaggeration, but you can see that the GDP fell in the early 1990s. What happened to government expenditure R&D? And this is the green curve here. So government expenditure on R&D actually went up during that period of downturn. And that's why I say R&D should be a counter cyclical activity. And in fact, a lot of this additional expenditure went into the development of 
the mobile sector, the mobile phone sector, or telecommunication sector in Finland in that period. And so what did that do? Well, that then stimulated private R&D investment, which is the blue line. So BERD is business expenditure on R&D. And then finally, it um, resulted in, and, and you need to look on the graph maybe on this side, but this uh, brown line here is the um, e electrical goods value added. So it's the economic activity in the um, electrical goods sector, which included mobile phones. And this is all published 2007 in Technovation, if you're interested in looking at that in more detail. But there are three important- uh, David, sorry to disturb. You've got about a minute left. Perfect, okay. So there are three important lessons from that. And the important lessons are that um, the uh, increase in public sector preceded um, BRD, BERD preceded the EVA. And thirdly, it was an, a very good example of mission-oriented R&D, which I think we um, need more of in South Africa. The third argument in favor of public sector R&D in the time of COVID is just this, these quotes which come out of the UK um, and the importance of public funding for, first of all, the AstraZeneca vaccine, secondly, the uh, world's largest COVID-19 trial before, called the recovery trial, um, which established dexamethasone as the world's first effective treatment, and then genomic sequencing, public-funded epidemiology and statistical modeling. So now the last part is to what should it be directed, and uh, this is where I, I divert a little bit, um, or digress, not, yeah, divert a little bit from the previous speakers in the sense that these are the areas in which I think that the innovation policy should be targeted. Hydrogen economy, energy storage, photovoltaics, and wind, and then vaccines, APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, and in communications, the whole area of photonics. And just in case you didn't see this, this slide comes from a presentation that was done uh, very recently in the Chris Yellen series on hydrogen economy. And it comes from Dr. Satya Pal, US Department of Energy in July, a few days ago, actually. And his claim, so this is just a, a depiction of the hydrogen economy. And the industry study shows potential for $140 billion growth in revenue, 700,000 jobs by, um, by 2030, and a 16% greenhouse gas reduction. So there's a lot happening on hydrogen economy. That wasn't what I wanted to cover today. But that's the end of what I have to say. I'll stop sharing. Um, let's go back to Mohammed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation, um, Professor David Warren, uh, and some interesting insights. I know I was particularly, uh, uh, you know, my my interest was piqued when I saw the, you know, the the devotion to hydrogen economy because that's some, that's an area that's getting a lot of focus at the moment and I know you referenced uh, Casey Ellen sessions as well which have been really informative around you know getting traction and the thinking going around the development of that uh, very interesting value chain in South Africa and which holds a lot of potential for for decarbonization in in many sectors and and you know traditionally hard to decarbonize sectors. So um, thanks thanks so much for that presentation. I'd like uh, I'd like all the presenters to switch on their video perhaps, and we can just um, go through go through some of the questions that have uh, that have come through um, in while while the sessions are going on. Um, I guess the first uh, the first question. Um, we can address is uh, is a question by Nathan Fredericks, and if I have this right, I think it's Nathan from the IDC. Um, and uh, Nathan's question is to the panelists: Are there any solutions to the challenges that have been presented? And here, uh, I'm assuming the challenges presented across the, the breadth of the presentations. And the question specifically goes as follows: How can we use this evil uh, minerals energy complex to grow value addition in other sectors, uh, other sectors, and, and and create jobs? So, to what extent can we leverage the, the kind of your the fossil intensive uh, mineral based uh, sectors of the economy to to transition and, and leverage off of? So maybe we can go in turn. Uh, maybe Katrina and Julia, if you guys want to start. Um. Thanks, thanks for the question. Um, so 
it is some more recommendations are detailed in our paper. So please do go have a look. But one of the suggestions that we've made around kind of how we use our existing technological capabilities to then leverage, um, you know, and leverage innovation and, and these kind of expertise for new industries like renewable energies is, I think, one of the key issues. And, and I think perhaps there's more research that's required to understand like how exactly, what are the best kind of tools and industrial policies that can be used to then attract investment from these companies that are established in mining, for example, um, to move it towards these new industries. Professor Wagon, we'll hand over to you. Yeah, I mean, the, it, don't forget that uh, mining companies are owned by shareholders, and shareholders have got their own views about what companies should do. Um, you know, they, this is company resources. How should they be applied? And there's, you know, there's so many different discourses and kind of think, uh, sets of thinking on this. That companies that are in the mining sector, that's what they should specialize in, and they shouldn't be diversified. And as we know, Anglo was hugely diversified in the 1980s. It owned 60% of the stock exchange. Um, and yeah, that, that kind of, that of course changed very significantly. I mean, the, the, the issue is that there needs to be opportunity for companies in the renewable energy sector and whether they're taken up by the mineral energy complex, which I think is still is now being very overplayed. I mean, this is an old analysis, uh, you know, Zav Rustin B and Ben Fine from so many years ago. Do we really still have a mineral energy uh, complex? Well, maybe we do. But in any case, the point is that some mining companies are already getting involved in the hydrogen economy and the renewable energy sector um, and have been for several years. So, Maybe they're not doing enough, and I think that is my criticism of what's happening. Is that, I mean, Anglo Plat have known for years that when the internal combustion engine disappears, seventy percent of their market or sixty percent of their market will go overnight because most of that, or a lot of their platinum goes not into jewelry, believe it or not, but goes into tipping of spark plugs and it goes into catalysts for exhaust. And so if that internal combustion engine goes, the market will shrink for Anglo Flat. And you know, they have been looking at obviously at uh, PEN FC, proton exchange membrane fuel cells over a long period as a way of ensuring that this market retains some volume. Um, and I just I suppose, you know, I think they could have been doing a little bit more and been much more proactive in their Hello. support for it. Yeah, oh, great. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for those responses. Um, I guess another question uh, I'd like to put to the floor is, um, so we, we all know uh, recently in the, in the world of just transition that's, that's evolving in South Africa, we've seen the presidential commission that's been set up, the Climate Change Commission, or the various names that it's been through. Um, what 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 do you feel should be prioritized in terms of uh, in terms of the commission's activities and and how how do you see this playing out is it a is it a useful uh, focus to have a, a, you know a state a state led body examining uh, the just transition and uh, do you see it as a useful uh, a useful uh, governance mechanism So we can start with uh, we can start with uh, um, with Katrina and Julia, and then move again in the sequence. I see Dominic's joined us again. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's been very interesting to see the, the P four C kind of unfold, and I think there have been some kind of maybe growing pains in trying to grapple with its kind of its mandate and how much uh, what exactly its role is and how it makes decisions. Um, but I think kind of one of the most useful parts of it is it's kind of much of the just transition debate to some people's kind of distress keeps coming back to a definition of a just transition and and is the p4c kind of a, a place potentially where there's there's kind of a general agreement at a national level about what that looks like um so for the p um the npc process tried to do that but i think despite that there's still a you know the grappling with with what it means and then i think you know in terms of where it's priority it's just that i think I can't really imagine not focusing on kind of coal and Mpumalanga, but also a recognition, I think, um, 
within the P4C about kind of the linkages that has with other sectors. Because I think kind of often that sector, those kind of the four key districts are viewed quite in isolation. Um, and so how can the P4C kind of map that out in a broader economic context will be, will be really interesting and important. Thanks. Thanks, I'll just add a, a quick point. I think I agree with Katrina's um, input and would just say that, you know, I think there's a danger at the moment that just transitions are reduced to technical transitions. I think Dominic mentioned it earlier. And, um, you know, some of the studies that are being done at the moment are really focusing in detail on the technical issues around electric vehicles, which are all important. But what I think we're really, um, I, I think, you know, I would feel is very important is that the justice aspect cannot be lost in these technical analyses. Um, you know, it can't be an add-on, it can't be something that happens at the end. This is why um, the con concepts that I know TIPS and Gaylor have been working on recently around procedural justice, distributive justice, and restorative justice really help to highlight the different kinds of justice and what, um, what that means for South Africans. Um, particularly with restorative justice, where there are currently environmental harms and climate change impacts that are being experienced within the country. And we cannot continue without addressing those, those impacts and finding out how to um, yeah, support the communities that are being most affected. Great, thanks. Uh, Dominic, sorry, we lost you for a bit there, but I see you're back. I don't know if you caught the question. Did, did you manage to catch that, that question? Okay. Yes, if it, if I may, uh, may I touch on the first question that was asked sure. again briefly? Sure, sure, that's fine. So, so, so as I was saying, um, some mining is going to be uh, required uh, for just energy transition. Um, the question or the argument is that how we seeing mining now is an extractivist based economy an economy that um, exports these commodities uh, regardless of the cost that it has on the environment and people. So the, and, and this relates, and I'll shift in, try and answer both questions in this way. So what we really require is a greater level of planning uh, so that what we have can be used in an effective way towards addressing the uh, ecological crisis that we are facing, but also the deep socioeconomic and structural issues that we are facing. At, and, and the idea of a just transition can potentially be a way of doing both if it's advanced on a full public model um, and that uses large levels of public finance to do this. So of course, an idea like the presidential climate committee uh, is useful but it's, it's extremely limited given that it's power, the power lies with corporations, a treasury who's com committed to neoliberal uh, austerity uh, policies, which includes the uh, increased privatization of essential services, which energy is a key component of. So, so I think that as much as the presidential committee is a useful one, uh, unless we are able to challenge the macroeconomic framework, the dominant macroeconomic framework, um, then it, it won't go very far in being able to address the, the deep ecological and social crisis that we're facing. So that's what we need to be questioning. We need to be questioning the, uh, the ideology and policies uh, within which uh, government is trying to address the ecological and social crisis. And of course, in doing so, we will see that in fact, it may, instead of uh, dealing with it, actually exacerbate existing. Uh... Okay, uh, thanks Dominic for that response. Professor Walwan, I'll hand over to you. The P4C, uh, what are your thoughts? If you from me, uh, I mean, I think it's very difficult to predict. I've seen lots of presidential commissions in the time that I, you know, since the 80s. And some of them led, in fact, by the same person who's leading this climate commission. Um, you know, the office of the RDP, for instance, which has some impact, but it's all about power and politics. You know, government is a highly disaggregated actor. In other words, there are lots of different interests, even within government. And, the, and so which ones are going to win out in the end? Very, very uncertain. 
the presidential commissions, my biggest problem with them is that they, they're not securely linked to power. I don't think that it's clear that even if they were to come to a certain decision, it would ever be implemented because do they have the president's ear or do they have the support of the departments or are they undermined by the administration or is parliament behind them? And so this is the issue of institutionalization. And I think, you know, I, I take a lot of um, kind of thought leadership from people like Johann Schott who wrote this article about deep transitions. We need a new directionality in our social systems and the directionality is around social justice and environmental justice. And until we get to that point where we are all going in the same direction, we can have presidential commissions till the cows come home, but not a lot is going to change in my view. But maybe that's just a throwing up, you know, throwing out the gauntlet for the presidential commission. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that, uh, for that uh, sobering input, uh, Professor Warren. Um, we, are, we do have a few minutes left. If there are any burning questions from our attendees, you're, you're welcome to raise your hands and we can unmute you if you have uh, any questions for our panelists here today. Um, if not, then um, I'll just take, I guess, one more question from the Q&A before we wrap up, uh, because I see no hands. Um, and um, so this is uh, this is a question from Bobby Berkowitz uh, for 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 Dominic. Um, so it says your focus on 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 the GEPF financing is based on taking uh, a state-owned enterprise, particularly ESCOM debt. Uh, how would you see the split between the historical coal boat versus uh, future renewable debt? Uh, and how much of scope is there to pick and choose among such financing? Um, so maybe we'll just sort of uh, end off on that question because I see no audience hands at the moment. So problems. Um, cool. Thanks, Mohammed. So um, I think maybe I should start off by saying uh, we will have coal uh, in the country for some time still. ISCOM produces uh, more than 80% of the energy in the country, largely uh, from the burning of coal. Um, of course, it's, I think we should debunk the misnomer that there's a clean coal. So whilst recognizing that coal is gonna be with, with us for some time, we need to think about how we can effectively plan a transition that will meaningfully address uh, South Africa's uh, big carbon footprint and move towards an ecologically sustainable future. In terms of how the government employees pension fund can work in relation to this, um, I disagree with uh, Mr. Valvain, I hope I'm saying your name right, um, that this would be plundering um, the government employees pension fund. I think what we are arguing, and by the way, all of this that I'm speaking to both on um, the dynamics at ESCOM and around the government employees pension fund. We've developed at AIDC four reports on both um, and you can find them on our website. The one's called ESCOM Transformed and the other one is called the Public Investment Corporation and the Financing of a Just Transition. Now, what we are saying is that it's not just a get out of jail free card. The government employees pension fund, which has um, some workers on its board can argue that uh, we'll take on some of ESCOM's debt and in fact finance a greater reindustrialization program going forward on condition that um, ESCOM um, remains fully public and that it urgently takes on the responsibility of um, developing um, renewable energy generation uh, in a full public model. And by this, I mean, we also start to question the issue of full cost recovery uh, which is a, a, a massive contradiction in a context where the majority of the people of the country are unemployed uh, and unable to afford um, rising electricity prices at all, let alone rising electricity prices. So currently uh, the government employees pension fund is more than 108% funded and it works under a fully funded scheme. It was shifted from a pay-as-you-go scheme um, in 1996. Now the fully funded scheme is actually unnecessary for a state uh, pension fund. It can operate back as a pay-as-you-go um, scheme. 
So what you are saying is that to convert back to a pay-as-you-go scheme, um, this will allow um, the government employees pension fund to um, free up more than more than a trillion rand, in fact, but based on these conditions. And so, if you look at the returns on the on domestic bonds, you will see that um, there's a stable and positive return um, on investment. And so, um, and it's also guaranteed, state guaranteed. So this is really a win-win for both workers at the pension fund and for the state um, over over the medium to to long term. So that there is, uh, and there's an array of other solutions. I don't disagree that we can use the Reserve Bank more effectively, but we shouldn't discount the fact that the uh, uh, massive investment into the JSE is not unrelated to the macroeconomic framework, which is what's driving an austerity agenda. And so understanding it in that way uh, and the connections and interconnections between the two, um, uh, can allow us to more effectively understand how to deal with the problem. And just finally, because uh, I've spoken a lot, to answer Neva Mechetla's question, what has changed since the disruption of the pandemic? What I would say what has changed is that many people around the world, even those who are most committed, the, 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 um, the voices of neoliberalism and privatization, like the Financial Times and so on, have come out to say we need public-led, state-led initiatives, and that investing in social services, in public employment programs, and large levels of public investment in a, a proper uh, just transition is in fact investments and not, uh, not a cost on society. And being able to understand things in that way uh, will allow us to get real about the decarbonization Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Dominic, for for that final input. I am conscious of time, so we have reached the end of our session. I really wish we could have been here for the rest of the afternoon. The, the debates are quite uh, uh, vigorous and uh, and alive, but unfortunately, uh, time is up. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, each and every one of our presenters here today at our session for for presenting some insights from the research that they're busy with. Um, the discussion and debate has been very lively. And this certainly isn't the end of the just transition story. In fact, arguably, it's only the beginning for us here in South Africa and in the South African policy landscape. Um, so thank you for thank you to all the, um, the presenters. And uh, I'd like to hand over to our overall organizers. Baba, you can take over. Uh, and we can sort of end the session and end, uh, end the, 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 the session today. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you to the presenters in session one and two and our moderators. You guys did a fantastic job. Thank you very much for your support. Just a quick one on day two, um, which is session three on advancing regional trade and recovery for a post uh, COVID uh, recovery starts at 10 a.m. tomorrow. So do join us. Um, we also have um, a second session tomorrow. If you would like to skip the morning, do join us again at half past 11 for session four on macroeconomic policy, industrial policy and social uh, protection protective or protection responses to COVID-19. So looking forward to tomorrow's program. In terms of uh, the presentations today, they will be loaded onto forum.tips.org.za. That's forum.tips.org.za, as well as the videos. In terms of the full papers, we will um, upload the papers that we have received permission to Otherwise, or alternatively, you can um, communicate directly with the uh, speakers or authors themselves. Um, you will see their contact details at the end of their presentations. Um, but yeah, thank you very, very much. Enjoy uh, lunch and see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. <laughs>